Thank you, Jacob. Uh, once again, uh, this is coming from the book of Mark. I'm using the uh, uh, Mark journal. Those are available to you at the welcome table, free of charge if you want to grab one. It allows us to take notes as we continue in God's word together. Um, let's read Mark chapter 4. We're going to cover a lot of verses for, for us, verses 1 through 20, uh, because it is one thought. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything's in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. You can be seated. God's word for God's people and, of course, for God's glory. Uh, I love this parable, like treasure it, adore it. But I also really dislike it this morning. Now, let me explain that. I treasure it because it's like a masterpiece work of art. Every time I look at it, I find new meanings, right? Like something I didn't see before, something deeper, or maybe on the side that catches my peripheral vision. I find undiscovered gems years later of great value that have actually changed my life. It's profound in its depth, very complicated, so it almost demands a lifetime of pondering to render the correct messages. So therefore, I treasure it. Now, I really dislike it this morning only because I'm the one that has to be up here and teach it. I, I probably literally would be horrified to listen to a sermon that I might have given on this text in Bible college or 20 years ago in a church, which means that I may be horrified to listen to this sermon 20 years from now. Um, Jesus speaks this parable and says that it will only serve to confuse and harden those who cannot hear. But even those who hear it are confused and confounded as well. So Jesus explains the parable to those closest to him, and I'm pretty sure by looking at the rest of the gospel narrative that they were still confused. Theologians with all kinds of important letters before their names who understand the original culture and language still to this day, this day disagree to a large extent on some of the finer points and implications of the parable. So good luck to me. You're in a better place this morning where you're at. But more than luck, I believe we have the Holy Spirit this morning. So this is the promise I'm going to make to you. I promise to once again state that I'm standing in humility before you and our God, and I know that I'm reliant upon the Holy Spirit for anything worthy to be taught or relayed today. I promise that I will only try to present truths that are present in this text and in agreement with other Holy Scripture. I also promise, and I will again assert, that greater than the perfect timeless interpretation, I will preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified as the main point of this sermon and any sermon, for our hope is in him and not in secret or clever interpretations by man. Now, I have a promise I want you to make to me since we're making covenants this morning. Your promise to me is only one, listen. 
listen. That's what Jesus asks of his listeners. Now, listen, when I say listen, I mean do not listen as a white person or as a black person or as a brown person or as a woman or as an American. Do not listen as an Arminian or a, a Calvinist. Do not listen as rich or poor, hurting or successful or all of those or none of those. Listen. Jesus yells with an exclamation point in verse 3. He says, listen. Akuo, exclamation point. He screams it. He's saying to his crowd, drop everything, all of your different varying things that you think you know, and listen, please, please, he says. And then at the end of the parable, in verse 9, he says it again. Those of you who have ears, listen, akuo. And I think all of you have ears. So, Listen, akuo, listen means listen actively, listen with wonder, listen ready to heed, listen ready to act, listen because you want the truth. And then I think maybe we together as a congregation, you know, I think we can, without your help a little bit, transform a YMCA into a place of worship. We did that this morning. But if we make these promises together, I promise the Bible says that we'll transform this place from a place of worship to a holy place of transformation. And that's what we all want. Let's pray. Father, this is your word. Um, may we get the correct messages out of it. May those things fall like seeds into our hands. And what is not the seed, the chaff, may it blow away before we even leave this morning. But the things that we are supposed to listen to ourselves, may we capture those and may they burrow deep into our hearts so that it gives life to something new new ways of thinking and being that will change our lives and finally solve some of the deep issues that we have with our own lives. I pray that over all of us, including myself this morning, is in your name. Amen. Parables are slippery things. Uh, people usually interpret them however they want. Now, the word actually means, like, bole means throw, to throw, and para means alongside. So a parable is throwing alongside. And so what it means is this is a walk of truth, and then somebody says, I'm going to throw alongside that truth a story, and it is known to be a fictitious story. Everybody knows that, but that truth will be parallel, or that uh, parable will be parallel with walking a truth. And the point is this, if you can walk this parable you can also walk along the truth claims and begin to make inferences and implications. So the, the purpose of a parable in Jesus' day and still today, I believe, is to both reveal and hide the truths along that other road. Think of it like stained glass win windows in a beautiful sanctuary. For those on the outside, it may still be meaningful and beautiful and even attractive to see the stained glass windows, but you really can't understand the stained glass windows unless you're on the inside where it's intended to have a message. So outside versus inside is kind of a key to all of the parables. Are you outside? Maybe you don't understand it. Are you inside? And maybe you can. Now, before I get into this parable and what it means, I want to explain the middle section a little bit so we understand what Jesus is saying when he talks about the purpose of parables, because verses 11 and 12, if you see in your text, are highly controversial, highly misunderstood. So let me just explain it. He's saying in those verses, I'm speaking in parables because it confirms the various states of people's hearts and leads them farther on that path. In other words, insiders will be confirmed by their faithful response to a parable by digging deeper inquisitive, longing for understanding. Outsiders will be confirmed in their faithless disbelief because why? They're just here for a show. They're here for a healing. They want to use me or maybe they're trying to trap me or trick me or build a case against me. And because of that, these other crowds, all they're going to get is a fictitious story for consumption. But you... Inside the cathedral, as he's talking to them, you're able to see the hidden but revealed truths of the kingdom. I read a commentary this week that said, it's really, you need to think of a parable as like a having, it's like a hook with a worm on it. And some fish, as you know, if you've ever been fishing, simply get the worm, right? And you bring in a hook and there's no fish. But insiders get the worm and the hook, and they're hooked into the truth and the gospel. By the way, in that section, verses, verse 12, 
Jesus is quoting Isaiah 6. Verse 12, he says, they see, but they do not perceive. They hear, but they do not understand. If they had been able to receive or perceive and understand, they could have been found forgiveness. They could have turned to me and repented, but they cannot. Now, this is a section he's quoting in Isaiah 6, and that's important because when the master quotes a scripture, he wants you to think about the other context. So in Isaiah 6, that's when God shows up to Isaiah and says, like this beautiful, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and he says, whom shall I send? Who shall go for me? And Isaiah essentially raises his hand and he says, I will, I will go, which is awesome. Uh, you know, God loves that. But then God tells him essentially right after that, these verses in 12, that no one will listen to him as a, as a, as a, a messenger, right? As a missionary. Nobody will repent and they won't turn from their sins. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like an awful like missionary, you know, initiative. But Jesus is saying here, the reason he's quoting Isaiah is he's saying, I am the real Isaiah that Isaiah was pointing to. I'm the new Isaiah because I have been sent by God. In other words, I raised my hand in the Trinity and said, I will go to them. And he knows, he's telling us that he knows that many people or most people will not listen to him and will not turn and will not repent. So that's what it means. That's what he's saying in verses 11 and 12. Parables like the gospel itself, I believe, has a way of revealing those who are chosen and who respond to that chosenness and also revealing and hardening those who are not. Now, having said that, I do get lots of questions about the sovereignty of God and how that interacts with what we call human free will. And I've spent time trying to explain how we really don't have free will. I've also spent a lot of time answering some of those questions while we were working through Genesis. But when people often struggle with this idea, God's active sovereignty, human free will, often when they come to me, I want to say, it, I don't say it because then I feel like, well, then they'll say, well, what are you getting paid for? <laughs> but what I want to say is it's above my pay grade. It's, it's, it's not my lane. That's God's lane. We see it. There's tension between divine active sovereignty and free choice or human will. And we see there's tension in the accomplishment of God's will. There's tension. But I know that there's not tension on his side of the tapestry. The tension is on our side. Why? Because we are not God. It's out of our pay grade. So it's better to just acknowledge the tension as a pastor or in your life when other people ask you and blame our frailty instead of blaming his lack of goodness or blaming his fairness. There's tension in the story that Jesus tells about Isaiah, right? Jesus is quoting Isaiah. God is wanting to send a prophet. Think about that. He's wanting somebody to go and speak words to people who will not respond. What? Pharaoh, if you remember in the Exodus account, he is attributed with making choices himself to deny God or deny the truth, and so therefore harden his own heart. It occurs about eight times where he makes those choices. But God is also attributed with hardening Pharaoh's heart six times in the text. Mark will say later, in, in Mark talking about Judas, he says, the son of man must be betrayed. See, that's the sovereign will of God. Must be betrayed as it is written. That's sovereign providence. But woe to that man through whom he is betrayed. So there's human choice and sovereignty of God. It will happen, but it sounds like Judas has a choice. Peter will say in Acts 2 that Jesus was handed over. He's preaching to the, the crowd after the Pentecost, and he says Jesus was handed over to be killed by men through God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. That is sovereign, active providence. God made sure it happened at just the right time. That's active God. But then Peter says, therefore... Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If you think about it as a thinking person, it's essentially Peter saying, how dare you be a part of what God planned for you to do? Now, God didn't cause them to do, but he planned it. And there's something about parables that work in this same realm of the mysterious, miraculous, gracious plan of God, both revealing 
softening and hardening. Hardening. Some, as we see through the scriptures, through the parables of Christ, are drawing closer and closer, and they're becoming more and more receptive to what he's saying, and they're listening, we might say, harder. And some are becoming more distant, more confused, more cold and more closed, even hateful and murderous. So that we can, I think, rightfully say that not only do Jesus' parables, and therefore I believe the gospel this morning, not only does it have the power to reveal one or the other in our midst, but it also has the power to be a tool by God to be used for either purpose. In other words, not just to reveal the state, but to be a tool for God to use and cause one of the other continuing states in a people's heart, in a human's heart. Now, having all said that, and you still go, I still don't understand, that's okay, because I've, people have spent a lifetime trying to understand this. What I want to say is it doesn't matter what you believe about that, really. It doesn't matter what you believe about parables or parables in general. It doesn't matter what you believe about the sovereignty of God versus human free will. That's all manipulation, and I love to talk about it as well. But the question from Jesus this morning is this. Are you listening? That's the question. Can you hear? What are you doing with what you know to be true the seed of the gospel, where is it landing in your heart? That's, that's what matters to Jesus. He's not trying to give an, a, a, a class on sovereignty. He's saying, listen, and you have a choice. So listen and see where the seed goes. Now, before I pull a few things out of this parable, let me remind you that Mark did not write his book in chronological order. I think I've said that before, but we need to be reminded of that. Uh, Mark's book is more like watching a slideshow, right? You have to think of it like that. It's not a chronological timeline. He has placed his slides about Jesus that he wants us to see in a certain order in his book for an impact that he wants. So even though, for instance, chapter 4 comes after chapter 3 and chapter 5 comes after chapter 4, we don't turn the book of Mark like we're turning a page in time in Jesus' life. And that's why Mark keeps connecting his thoughts with words, connecting words, or connecting the sentences with words like this. Again, this happened. When he was alone, and you're like, when was that? He, he doesn't want you to know. He says, at another time, he might say, or again, Jesus went. And you're like, I don't know when this was, because he's sewing these stories together as slides to show us. And he has re reasons for p pulling his material together in a certain way, because we have to understand, and we've talked about this in the very first chapter, Mark's reason for writing the book is to bring hope and clarity to the persecuted Gentile Christians in Rome. He had no idea we were going to be talking about it today. The Holy Spirit did, but he didn't. So he's saying, this is my purpose. I need to bring hope to these people who are dying in my midst and dwindling in this terrible place of persecution. And so in this section, chapter 4, he puts all of the parables of Jesus that he wants to put. Now, there's not all of them. There's over 60 parables in the other Gospels that are talked about, except for John, Matthew, and Luke. But Mark has chosen just the few that he wants to choose, and he's placed them all in chapter 4. Because Why? Because this is the place where there's tension between what we have just studied before. In other words, there's all of these various crowds that are following him. There's crowds of opposition. There's these massive crowds of fandom, I might say, and there's a few of the crowd who are disciples, and all of those are converging, and the, and the question that we might ask is, so what's the difference in the crowds? Like, why do some see him for who he is and some do not? Because people are not gathering in droves to love him and give their lives to him. That's not happening. They're not gathering in droves to worship and adore him. Most of the people simply want to use him for a miracle because that's the most important thing in their life. They're hurting and he has power to heal them. Or there's a few who want to kill him. There's a few who think he's crazy, but there's really the smallest few are those who are actually hanging on his words and are willing to give their hearts, soul, mind, and strength to Jesus. And so why such a disparate response? Why are everybody is across the map and it's the same Jesus? Now we have a parable. So Mark is allowing Jesus to answer those very questions in his midst and the same questions they would have had in the first century being Christians in Rome. He's answering questions about the kingdom and what it looks like and why some people respond and some don't. And he's drawing, Jesus is drawing his own lines about what makes an insider and what makes somebody an outsider to the kingdom. 
And what he's saying, which would have been new to them, and Mark is repeating, is being an insider is not about religious zealotry or devotion to religion. It's not going to be cultural. It's not going to be political. It's not going to be men and not women. It's not going to be worldly governments or affiliations. So what he does is he's essentially wiping the chalkboard of their culture, and he's redrawing the lines of the kingdom. But I need you to know this so you know that Jesus just isn't like freelancing. It's the same lines that have been there from the very beginning of the Bible. They just missed it. In other words, let me say this out loud because some people still are confused about this. Being culturally a Jew could not save you. Just being born in a culture and being a Jew could not save you. Being circumcised could not save you. Dietary laws could not save you. Sacrificing to the priest could not save you. The only thing that ever and only saved all through the Bible, and Paul makes sure we hear that later, is faith. And that's the same thing in the New Testament. And that's the purpose of this specific parable, to redraw, or I say re-emphasize, what faith looks like and what it doesn't look like because you need to have faith soil in order to be saved. Now, your Bible probably has, I know this ESV Bible has the heading, the parable of the sower. Most Bibles do. I want you to know that I strongly disagree, and if you cross that off, that's great. By the way, you're not crossing off the words of God. A human put that title in. Nor should I think it should be called the parable of the seed, nor is it the parable of farming. It should be called the parable of the soils. Notice that the sower, the seed, and the method of sowing are the same in verses 3 through 9, which is the first half of the parable, and verses 14 through 20, which is the second half explanation of that parable. The emphasis, therefore, of Jesus, and therefore Mark to his audience, was on the reception of the seed. What kind of soil do you have? Whether one is hard-hearted, right, that's the first one, or shallow but soft-hearted, that's the second one, more thoughtful but distracted and misaligned in their devotions, that's the third soil, or is it the fourth soil where you're attentive and faithful to the message that Jesus was proclaiming? And by the way, it is the message that we proclaim today. Jesus is proclaiming the gospel of God, it was called in Mark 1. And so that means that Jesus is saying, and Mark is telling his audience, and therefore I'm telling you that these are the applications that he's making for them emotionally. Now, let me give these three immediate emotional applications. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but I think you'll see them when you understand the parables. First of all, I think Mark is saying to his crowd, Jesus is saying to his disciples, and I'm saying to you, do not be discouraged. Do you see why? Because one of the things we cannot control in the church is the soil. Do you see that? Over three-fourths of the crowd were rejecting a message of salvation from the Savior himself. Now, why do we think we're going to do better? So Mark is saying to his people who are dwindling through persecution, there's large-scale rejection. Be encouraged. God knows what he's doing. Just so. The second thing I think he's saying to his people, and therefore Mark is saying to his people, Jesus saying to the disciples, I'm saying to you, trying to get the same exact interpretation, is he's saying, please be patient. The disciples and Mark, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, they never really acted like disciples until after the resurrection. Because why? Because not only can we not control the soil, we can't control the growth Think about that. Growth is God's work. We can water, but that doesn't mean you can control the growth. In fact, later Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6, he will say, and I quote, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it. See, those things humans can do. But God has been making it grow. And then he says, so neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. See, we're, we're, he's saying we're nothing, but God, he says, but only God who makes it grow is the thing that matters. So listen, just breathe when you see people around you not acting right. God says, be patient. 
I'm the one doing the growth. Just keep planting, keep watering. Third, the application for me, it's a little scarier, but it's, Mark is, I think, saying to his people, Jesus is certainly saying to his disciples, so therefore I'm saying to you, beware or be aware. Every time the gospel, including this morning, is spoken, spiritual warfare is happening in our midst. Every time the gospel is spoken, spiritual warfare is on. Every time a true seed is thrown into a soil, Satan and the hordes of hell go to work. How do they do that? Through hardness and unopenness to the gospel, through lack of humility to the gospel, through discouragement because of what people are going through, through boredom, through pride, through, through a challenge of suffering in their lives and they no longer want to hear it, through, through worldly distraction, through alternative goals and desires. And so here's what I want to say to you, because you're like, beware. And you're like, yeah, I'm thinking about the person next to me. You can't beware for anybody else but you, right? Only for yourself. You are going to answer the question this morning for you, as I did through this week for me. What kind of soil do I have? Now, those are the three easy emotional applications that I believe 20 years from now I'll still be okay with. Now, let me give you some insights, more longer term insights into the implications of this metaphor or parable that Jesus uses to describe insiders and outsiders to the kingdom. And I'm going to stand on these insights in 20 years from now, if I'm wrong, I'm still going to say, I think I was right. Just kidding. But I think these, I'm so, I think these are right, really do, or I wouldn't talk about them. Here's the three insights that I hope you see in the text. The first long term insight is this. The word of God is the power of God, and it's like a seed. Do you see Jesus saying that? And that means that there is a mysterious power to a seed in an organic way. The best way I understand this power of God with through the word is that I know as a human, Don Logan, that when I speak, People may or may not listen, and nothing may happen. Now, I know that in my home. I know that in my marriage. I know that with my kids. Right? I know that as a pastor. So when I speak, something may happen, but maybe probably nothing will happen. But when God speaks, something always happens. In other words, my words do not have creative power. His words have creative power. In the beginning, in our very first text that we study, it says, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And what happened? There was light. It does not say, <coughs> God said, let there be light. But just a minute, I need to go to my lab, figure out how to make this light and spread the dust into the darkness. I'm working on it. Nor does he say, let there be light. And then it says, and God clicked his fingers. He didn't say, let there be light. And he waved a wand. That's our movies. God speaks and it happens. His words have creative, or we might say recreative powers that we do not have. And so we see that Peter, who's really the one who authored this book, I mean, Mark wrote it, but Peter's, it's Peter's story, stories. Peter would write later in 1 Peter 1.23, <clears throat> for you have been born again, not of parables, perishable seed, do you see that? But of imperishable, it says, through the living and abiding, what? Programs of God? The word of God. The word of God, the gospel, is a word. Now, let's talk about this a little bit. The truth of the gospel has to be contained somehow, and we contain it as human, humans in words. Of course it has words. But the words can't contain the entire truth or the power of the gospel. Do you see the difference? Let me explain. It's like a seed. In other words, it looks like something in your hand that has boundaries. It's clearly a thing that you can see. There's, there's an in or an out to the seed, right? That's why you can see it. And so we do the same thing with the gospel. The gospel has words, and we say those words are important to contain the gospel. In other words, Jesus Christ is God's son. Do you agree? Jesus Christ is the Savior. Do you agree? Jesus Christ is God incarnate, God in the flesh. Jesus Christ died for my sins. Jesus Christ became the punishment of God for me. Jesus Christ became the righteousness that God demanded. Those words matter, and those are spoken words that contain truth. But what Jesus is saying, but inside, the, the seed inside the soil, 
those truths are released and become not less than, but more than those words. Do you see that? It has life. It has a power greater than the words. So, it's really important that we get the content right. That is important. It, you can't just say, well, then it doesn't matter what we say. The seed matters. In fact, it matters so much that Paul says in Galatians 1.8, he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. He was so adamant that it was the correct seed that he said, if anybody, even an angel shows up from heaven, and you know it's an angel right from God, and they give you a different seed, let that angel go to hell, is what he says. It's not a right seed. Paul cared so much about what the seed was that he even went to Jerusalem to talk to the apostles and spend a lot of time to them because he was preaching to the Gentiles and he wanted to make sure that what he was preaching to the Gentiles is the same seed as the one they were preaching to the Jews. Can we compare seeds? I want to make sure it's the right one. Let's make sure we have the same seed because that's important. That's important, congregation, and that's why we care about what's being preached out there. But... The point of this parable is that the gospel is a real seed, and it has real words, but don't get stuck there. It's more than those words. It goes into the soil, and it explodes into something else greater than that seed, as every seed does. Some of you, not many of you, because you're so kind and patient, have asked me, what's taking so long to build a new church building? Like, my kids are probably the main culprits for that. Like, Dad, you know, two years ago, it was like, we're going to, yes, we're going to do that before you go to college. And now they're like, Dad, we're going to college in August, right? It's like, okay, maybe not. Um, but there's some impatience for people who have been through the process. And by the way, great news coming, not this morning, but later. So be patient. <laughs> but let me tell you why it's taken so long. Four years ago, I went out to the property with a lot of prayer, and I had one piece of metal and one brick and one piece of wood, and I dug a hole and I buried it. And I have been back weekly for four years praying that that seed will grow into a building. <laughs> and so it's my fault. Now, of course, I'm joking. Because you're saying, uh, that's not how you build a building. That's right, you're right. It takes people who love process and planning and paperwork and signatures and town processes and mechanics and bricks placed on bricks and wood placed on wood and metal on metal in the right order, by the way, with the right time and people looking at all of the people and subcontractors and contractors are gonna come and do it all exactly right. That's great and it's exactly how a building is created, but let me tell you this, church, in case you haven't heard, that's not how a Christian is made. It is not, even though I keep feeling from people that that is how we're supposed to do it. People say, you want to make disciples, that's what you want. Well, what's your discernible goals? What's a disciple? Well, brick on brick, planning, order, structure, program, money, books, timing, classes. And after three years, we say, we've made 30 disciples. Well, how do you know what a disciple is? Because we defined it. Well, what's the definition of a disciple? That they love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength? No, that's not, that's not specific enough. You need a measurable goal. Oh, they love their neighbor as themselves. Not specific enough. Measurable goal. Okay, they've talked to three people in their life about Jesus Christ. Great, that's a disciple. Is that a disciple? No. The Bible says a disciple is made by a seed. It's a bulb that grows into a tulip. It's an acorn that grows into a mighty oak. What do we do as a church? We sow community and people and trellises. We water, but who grows? God makes a disciple. It goes into the heart of somebody, and finally, it will explode. And for some, it's not gonna explode until they go through suffering, no matter what you say, no matter what book they read. For some, they need to reject it first and it gets replanted. For some, it goes through questioning and doubt and deconstruction. For some, it has to go through suffering and then boom, it takes life. For some, there's great loss, disease, 
But for some people, they just have it easier. Like they, they just, as a little girl or boy, they said, I love Jesus. And they've always loved Jesus. It was just the song on the radio or it's a convention. I mean, I remember going to, remember conventions? We used to go to those, right? Like I remember going to Promise Keepers. It's like, and now I love Jesus, right? Like because I've made a promise and all this stuff. For some, it's sidetracking. There's rebellion first or resentment for God. It happens differently for us, but it will come to life because God's growing it, and it begins to grow. And, and when that person grows at first, it may not look like a person who suddenly get busier in church, and they're stronger in their service, and they start tithing more, and they show up every Sunday. Those are all good things, by the way. But I'll tell you how I see it mostly. When I talk about Jesus Christ, who tears up at the mention of his name? It doesn't just look like I'm standing for Jesus courageously in my community. It also looks like being sensitive to the broken world in your community. It looks more generous sacrificially without anybody asking for your stuff. It looks more submissive. What do you want me to do, Pastor? Not, I know what I need to do. Will you get beside me so I can do it? It looks more humble. It looks more gentle. It looks more forgiving. You start thinking of others more, and then you go, oh, I think we have a disciple. There's growth in our midst. And let me tell you something, people. Classes, books, programs, wood, metal, mechanics cannot make that. It's the truth of the gospel coming alive in a mysterious spiritual way in the soil of someone's heart. And our job is to so, so, so water, water, water until it does. Has that happened to you is my question after point one. Forget religion, please. Forget behavior modification. Forget this book you read about the six steps to Christian freedom or the eight levels of Christian growth. Throw them away. Have you felt the gospel coming after you? Have you, have you felt it breaking down your defenses little by little, drawing you to church where there's truth spoken because even though it hurts, you want to hear it? Has, has the gospel been dealing with you, coming after you, exciting you maybe, or maybe even scaring you so you leave more quickly on Sunday? You can't talk to anybody right now. Does it make you unsettled? Does it make you cry at things that you've never cried at before? Like I cry at the stupidest commercials now. I'm just softer. But I've also, in the last 10 years with Christ, I've started to consider more things than I've ever considered before. Like, I need to think about why we're doing what we're doing and why we live where we live and where we live and how we live and where our kids go to college. And suddenly all these things that didn't matter, matter. It's beautiful, but it's mysterious work and it's God's work. Now, that's the first insight, I think. But there's a second insight I want to talk about. And that is that the depth of the soil or the implantation of the seed, as deep as it goes in, coincides perfectly with your end result. Now, let's talk about the first soil. And you can see it in the soils. The first soil, some seed stays on the upper level of the soil. Easy picking. Birds come, snatch it up before it can work down into the soil. Most people hearing this sermon today, even right here this morning in our midst, are thinking of something else right now. They're thinking of church, people, somebody, at lunch, after church, what they're going to see, glad that North Carolina won, hate that Duke lost, whatever it is. Most people online this morning are listening, but later we see that people will click on the sermon, and after about 30 seconds up to about four minutes and a half, we lose them again. I don't know why. They might look and say, ah, it's not great lighting. Oh, I don't like his sweater or T-shirt. I think a lot of people say, he's too handsome to be a pastor. <laughs> Amen. That's right. I mean, because we don't know what it is, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. But some people, it just, they're just moving on. Doesn't mean anything. Second soil some people receive the gospel, but it doesn't go down very deep. And Jesus says that that's because it's just a raising your hand. It's just saying, Jesus, you're my forever friend, and that's it. There is no call to deny yourself, take up your cross, give your life to Jesus. There's no, there's no root system that says, you're wrong, he's right, 
bow your knee, get right with God, and Jesus Christ is your rightness. It is this gospel that is preached so many places that is me plus God and God will help me be me. Me plus God and God will make me my best self and I'll be an overcomer. Me plus God because God loves me and affirms me just as I am. Me plus God and he will protect me. Me plus God and he will help me with this issue in my life and that's why I'm a Christian. But if you notice in all of those soils, me is still at the center. And so what happens when trouble comes, Jesus says, when persecution comes, which what does that mean? When something comes to attack the me, when something feels like, and you'll feel this at times with the gospel, that there's something outside that's coming to kill the you, then it's no longer what I want. I'm out because I got in this so that God would help me, not kill me. I got in so that my mom would not die from cancer, and she did. I got in this so I wouldn't lose a baby, and I did. I got in this so I would never get sick, and I'm sick. I got in so my finances would be better, and they're not. So instead of dying, something that's trying to kill you, you kill the plant. It's never, it was never planted deep enough. The me was never challenged with the gospel. That's soil too. Third soil says some receive the gospel, and they take it in, but it only goes as deep as the other seeds that were planted in their heart. So, I love God. This is what I call a lot of times, it's not really fair, but some people will call it Southern Christianity. It's kind of like the signaling of church is okay here and people go to church. It's kind of like, I love God, I really do. But there's other concerns that I care about as well that are just as important as God. My job might be just as important as God. My children, my marriage, my finances, my home, my leisure time, my hobbies, my vacation. Don't tell me what to do, pastor, and all those other things. And this person, I really do believe this person loves God. But I also believe that this person also really loves other things that have been planted. And so what the common denominator is and why they can't stand for long with hearing the true gospel is they're kind of like, I just hear you talking and it's like, can we not go overboard with this stuff? Can we just like talk about how to help my child with three points? Let's not talk, please, about my schedule, my money, my sex life, my employment, my spouse that I might choose or not choose, et cetera. And and I believe that that is a problem in the church because those other desires that that you don't want to admit are also God's. They're planted as well in your heart And if the gospel tries to grow up with them instead of them, instead of the gospel destroying those other seeds, if the gospel tries to grow up and other things grow up with it and you're like, that's fine, it'll all work out in the end, eventually the gospel will get choked out because Jesus says no one can serve what? Two gods. You can only actually serve one and so you're always only actually serving one. That's the third soil. But then we have the last soil. The seed goes all the way down into the deep, good soil, and the roots go down, and it slowly, slowly begins to grow up. And I want you to notice something, that the seed, this mysterious action, uh, which I think Paul mentions when he says um, that he's working out his salvation with fear and trembling, like it's a seed interacting with the soil. It's not just the seed on cement, right? It's the seed and the soil together. There's an interaction that gives birth to something. Now, what, it, what is that? Well, I think the first step is what Jesus says because he's talking to us and he says, listen. I think it starts there. The seed interacts with soil and it begins with listening. Now, you have to know that word, akuo. It means heed, take it in deeper, listen again, think about it, pray about it, read about it. Because I know what you're listening to right now, but the question is, what are you listening to after church? And what are you listening to in the evenings? And what are you listening to on Monday afternoon? And what are you driving to work with? And what are you listening to? And I can tell you right now, because I've been around people who have listened to news channels enough or the culture enough or science enough, that it's whatever you're listening to is making you. It's forming you. And so the gospel is not like a diving board and we jump into the waters of salvation. The gospel is the diving board and the water. It's the only way to also grow is the gospel. It's the gospel, it's the gospel. The seed never changes. It has to go deeper for a Christian to begin to grow. 
Dan mentioned a couple of days ago, or a couple of Sundays ago that Jesus' call to his disciple, disciples was a call first to be. Remember that? And then later it was to do. By the way, they never really got to doing correctly, if ever, until much later when Jesus was resurrected and they got the gift of the Holy Spirit. But we always talk about the Acts 6 uh, issue in Jerusalem, and that's when the church was growing and they had this issue where some widows weren't getting fed and they needed somebody to do more, or do more correctly for them. And so the church fixed that issue by doing better and doing more, and then the Bible says the church grew and multiplied. Now that painting, that narrative of that story is true, but it's only partially true, and I think it is also misleading. I want you to understand that I believe that the real crisis in Jerusalem was that the apostles felt like they were being pulled away from being. That's the crisis. Because they knew if they had to do this themselves, they would get pulled away from what? The Bible says, prayer. They were getting pulled away from their relationship with Christ. They were getting pulled away from this gospel communication. In other words, what's the seed, Christ? Keep talking to us. We need to make sure we're planting the right thing. And if we start doing all of these deeds, of course those deeds will get done. But the real power, which is the seed, will be sacrificed for that. So I'm not saying deeds are not important. They are. They're even necessary. And the, seed, the, the deeds will accompany someone who's a Christian. But notice how it works in the Bible. Gospel seed goes in. Faith grows up, deeds, fruit come later. Why do I say this? Because we always mess with this order. If something is amiss in a Christian, and I think we could all raise our hand and say there's something amiss in us, right? I don't know what yours is, but let me just name a few. So let's say that some of us are not doing enough, serving enough. That's an issue. Or some of us struggle with racism. That's an issue. Or some of us lack generosity. We just keep our money to ourselves. Now, we say as a church, what do you do about that? Guess what? It's a seed issue. The reason why people serve more who serve correctly, the reason why we become missional and do more is because we have loved the one who was sent to us from somebody else, and we have loved that person so much and for so long that we begin to look like him. Being missional was God's idea. And so it is transferred to us through being with Christ. That's how we want to start being and doing more, is because we've been with Christ enough to look like him. We crush racism because a different one than us came to love and rescue us. That we had no standing or right before him, and yet while we were sinners, the Bible says Christ died for us. And then it says for Roman, for Greek, for woman, for slave. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. All of us sinners, all of us depraved, all of us needing Jesus Christ. And so look, the only truly better race didn't use his position with God as God for his own advantage, Philippians says, but made himself nothing even unto a slave, humbled himself, became obedient unto death, shackled to a cross. You don't crush racism in a church by a pastor standing up and say, don't dare you be racist. You say, have you got the gospel seed in your heart? Push it down deeper. You're struggling. Think about it. Think about who Christ is. Think about what he did for you. How is that in line with the seed of the gospel? We become a generous church by how? By seeing, understanding, hearing that Christ who had all treasure, who lacked nothing and needed nothing, gave up his treasure even to become the opposite of treasure, to become a curse upon the cross, the Bible says, so that by giving up his treasure that he didn't need to give up and shouldn't have given up, he could have us. And we go, that's what generosity looks like. So we become more generous by telling people to get the gospel. And we, we're not, listen, are, do you think you're going to give more if I get up and say, guys, we really need you to give more? Maybe, but it will be only temporary gains. A church becomes generous when they push the gospel down farther. How dare you not be in line with the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he gave to you? See, the gospel's not going deep enough. And what we do is we say, no, no, no. Listen, we've tried this gospel seed thing. Now let's bring in the bricks and the wood and the cement and let's make something. Instead, we need to say, how's your lack of generosity in line with the gospel? Think about it. Marriages that break up, I know, listen, 
I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. But we break covenants in our midst. And instead of saying, here's a book to keep your marriage together, what I want to say is, how is breaking your covenant in line with the one who died to keep his covenant with you? When you broke your side of the covenant, he didn't. What's the problem? Not a book. It's not me yelling. It's not me shaming. Take the seed. Push it down farther. Get it. You don't need bricks and wood and metal to fix what's going on. You don't need a book on being generous. You don't need a book on anti-racism. You don't need a book on seeing, serving your community correctly. You need a seed to go deep enough to explode into something that changes your life from the inside out. And that's the way, by, this, by the way, that's how the early Christians became the most serving, the most anti-racist, the most generous community the world has ever seen on the face of the earth. Do you think they were passing books to each other? They were saying, Christ died for us. What are the implications of that? And those are some of the implications, is that you're changed. We don't need, we don't need, and I've said this before, we don't need to nail apples to a telephone pole and say, look, fruit. We need to plant seeds in our midst, and we need communities to water them so that we can become trees that produce together, and it takes time. Okay, last insight for me this morning. Notice that the seed only has real power when it dies. I think it's fascinating that Jesus uses this analogy because it turns our minds upside down on the concept of power, right? Like think about a seed, why that? Why not say the gospel is like a machine gun or like a shovel or something? It's like a seed. A seed can easily be rejected, right? And in fact, three of the four soils do, in fact, reject the seed for various reasons. Why? Because it's just a seed. Like all of you, raise your hand if you've held a seed, right? You just, you can kill it. You can, it can get trampled, eaten, choked, scorched, whatever. But if it goes down into the soil and if it has time to grow... It produces a crop, Jesus says, 30, 60, 100 times greater than that seed, which in their day and in our day today would be a miraculous production. So what is Jesus saying to all of us? Again, I think it's about being encouraging, but he says no matter how it looks, even though it looks like a losing endeavor to do the gospel this way in a midst, it's not at all. No matter how it looks, What I'm telling you as a pastor, what I'm committed to, is it's not only the right way to grow Christians, it's the most productive way to grow Christians. It just takes a while. In fact, the Bible says an eternity to see it. But someday, it says, every tribe from every nation will bow before his throne And every one of those will be people who had the seed planted down in their heart. And when they struggled, they pushed it down farther. And they struggled, they pushed it farther. And I know the weakness, the weakness actually feels like a weakness. But it's the strength of the gospel. It dies and something greater is created. In fact, you could put a seed right on top of a cement slab and take a hammer and just go, done. Seed is dead. But you know what? You could also plant that seed under the slab of cement and give it some time, and it'll crack the cement. Have you ever been to an old cemetery? My family loves to go. Wherever we're at, we like say, let's pick the oldest cemetery and let's walk through. I don't know if we're weird or not. Please tell me we're not weird. We love looking at dates, and then we'll guess how they died. Should I have not said that, Heather? They didn't respond well to that. We're like, what happened there? There's a mom, a baby who died on the same day. Dad died three years later. Hey, maybe this is their story, right? We, like, we just look and we think about the people. But if you've been to enough of these old cemeteries, what you do know for sure is that you have seen toppled headstones and cracked mausoleums. Why? Because of plants. Bushes, roots, grass. A hill was there that wasn't there a hundred years earlier. You know why? Because seeds are stronger than cement. Haven't you ever seen futuristic movies as they're walking through what used to be New York City? What does it look like, right? It's always trees and plants. It overtakes everything. That is what Jesus is saying. It looks weak, but is it? The reason Jesus Christ could give us that kind of seed 
is because Satan, who only knows the other type of power, could not envision power looking anything like, well, power. But this Aslan, this emperor beyond the sea, knew of a deeper magic. One, by the way, that I will say as I close here, that you can know in part, you can start practicing this seed today because when you forgive somebody who doesn't deserve your forgiveness, oh my goodness, when you say you're sorry for just a misunderstanding and you don't feel like you did anything, but you actually mean I'm sorry, when you, when you come to the end of your behavior because you love something and you start behaving anyway just because love is stronger than a feeling, we crack cement. Slabs are broken in our midst. Marriages stay together. Racism is crushed. People start giving money. You see, we just don't want to do it. We don't want to push the seed down because we don't want to die. And this one, Jesus Christ is saying to all of us, the hook inside the worm, right? The hook inside of the parable is Jesus. He is the picture from inside the cathedral. If you get inside, all of the stained glass windows look like Jesus. So he's saying, I'm the seed. I'm the first seed. I'm the only perfect seed. Make seeds later that look like me, but I'm telling you what I'm going to do. And Jesus did. He said, I'm going to the, go into the ground. I'll be pushed down, and I'll be crushed, and I'll die. And it will look like complete and utter weakness. Demons will throw a party. Disciples will run away. But three days later, I'll split the slab and come out. Amen? That's the power of the gospel. It's the same thing. We're not going to get there by bricks, metal, and wood. Get it in. He dies, and we live. He lives, and we arise with him. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for this time today, this morning, to preach your word and to once again proclaim the gospel in our midst. Father, we, we bind the darkness around us with Jesus Christ, the name of your Son, the name of our Savior. We bind the darkness that keeps us from seeing, that keeps us from changing, that keeps us from forgiving, that keeps us from wanting to forgive, that keeps us broken and moving and hoping for something better. We die to our expectations, what we wanted from the gospel that we're not getting. Father, just help us to keep pushing your son deeper into our heart. Help us to go to the cross, to lay our deadly doing down, to behold you, to look to you, and to re-engage the seed, to have it burst in our lives so that we can grow up. And it's okay, Father, it might take time. But please, Father, continue to do a good work in our hearts. It's in your name I pray. Amen.